Good evening. I am Carlo Gabler, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to the Irish Cultural Centre's Digital Literary Festival. The centre is based in Hammersmith, London, and for the past 25 years has delivered to its patrons an incredibly diverse Irish cultural and educational programme, the most diverse outside Ireland. The festival comprises a series of interviews featuring some of the most successful authors in contemporary Irish writing. They'll be discussing their work and in some cases reading from their recent publications. Tonight, I will be in conversation with John Banville about his, his life, his work, and his outstanding new novel, Snow. John, good evening. Good evening. Um, I thought I would ask you, because you've had a very long career, maybe just to tell us where you come from and a little bit about the early trajectory of your career before we get to the present. Yeah. Well, um, I was born in Wexford, South East Ireland. Uh, in the 1950s, not the most exciting place in the world. It has left me with a lifelong terror of boredom, which I make many mistakes trying to avoid being bored. I hope we all do. Um, lower middle class, upper working class, whichever you like. Um, not a bookish household. Kindly parents. So I had that most disastrous thing for a writer. I had a happy childhood. So I had to make many mistakes after the childhood in order to work up the guilt and the, the general horror that every writer needs. Um, I went to school in Wexford, more boredom. Um, my mother, who was very ambitious for all her children, wanted me to be an architect. God knows why. I had no gift for mathematics or draftsmanship, any of that stuff. Um, so I left as early as I could. I think I was about 17, 18. I went to work for the airline, Erlingus, with the simple aim of getting off the island as often as I could. So I was a clerk uh, working in Dublin. Had a wonderful flat that I inherited from my aunt in Upper Mount Street. Big, two big Georgian rooms, hideously uncomfortable. In winter, some winter mornings I would wake up and there would be ice on the inside of the windows. Um, but it was delightful. Um, I was already writing. I'd been writing since I was about 12, I think, when my sister or my brother, my sister insisted that she, uh, gave me a copy of Joyce's Dubliners. This is a great revelation to me. I found that writing could be about not just Wild West yarns or Treasure Island or detective stories or stories about chaps in English boarding schools, but that writing could be about life as I knew it. It could be ordinary and rather dull. And that the dull, ordinary life, Joyce, of course, said he never met an ordinary person in his life, and I agree with him. But what I thought of as dull and ordinary could be transformed, could be illuminated by art. So I immediately began to write hideously bad imitations of Joyce's short stories. And I kept plugging away at it year after year after year. Uh, and then when I was about, I guess I was 18, I wrote a not very good short story called The Party. I mean, I'd written dozens upon dozens of short stories, thrown them away. But this one, even though it wasn't very good and I knew it wasn't very good, a strange thing happened, uh, or it seemed to me strange, that it drifted away from me. It wasn't mine. When it was finished, it took on a little autonomous life of its own. And uh, that was when I knew that I could be a writer. I had a lot of work to do and a lot of heartache and anguish to go through. Uh, which, of course, I'm still going through because I'm still practicing, I'm still learning. I'm still hoping before I go that I will learn to be a writer. I love that anecdote of Henry James on his deathbed. He was in a coma, but his hand was still moving across the sheet. He was still <laughs> And I hope the same for myself, and I have done. I've had, I will write the perfect sentence then. Nobody will know about it, but I will. Mm -hmm. I'm very interested 
that your mother wanted you to be an architect because one of the things that struck me and has struck me about your books, but in particular about Snow, because it's the one that I've read most recently, is the control of space is incredibly apparent. Where people are in the room, where the other people are in the room, where the light is coming from. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's an, there's a, you are attuned to the built environment and to the way that human beings is, exist within it in a way that architects ought to be. So your mother, your mother understood. <laughs> I wish she, you knew more, more about that than I. I never thought of that before. It's an interesting point. Yes, I do need to know where people are. Um, I do need to know where they are in the room, and vaguely what they look like. Which, yes, is, I, which is also a very joyce it's a very Joycean thing. Because yeah. in Dubliners, it's, you know where people are in space. Um, yes, you see, the trouble for, for those of us who came after Joyce, and if we were living in Dublin, he had used up the city. <laughs> there was nothing more to be done in Dublin. So anything I said in Dublin, I don't identify it because it's, it's immediately would be seized on, oh, this is a reference to, to Joyce. I mean, somebody said to me the other day, obviously, snow is a reference to Joyce's story of the dead. Mm -hmm. Well, I can tell you it's not. It wasn't in my mind at all. But, uh, you know, we have so many illustrious forebears. I've said it before, but I still think that Irish writers feel like they're on Easter Island, you know, with all these enormous stone statues glaring at him, mm -hmm. looming over him or her and saying, uh, look what we did. What are you going to do, little person? Uh, we have to fight with that extraordinary tradition. I mean, it is a, a sustenance, but it's also a great, a great weight looming over us. Mm. Well, I think you've done some pretty remarkable, you've, you have made some pretty remarkable objects yourself, literary objects. You've, you've, you've got two names. Can we talk about the two names? Well, that's quickly done because I've killed off Benjamin Black. I know. Um, but you, you wrote a number of novels under that moniker, as well as a number of other novels under Banville. But then you decided, w w what was wrong with Mr. Black? Why did he have to go? Well, I'll tell you exactly what happened. It's quite simple. Um, I was writing, I had to write a, a, a sequel to one of the books. Never had to go back and read it. I can't bear to read my own writing. It makes me physically ill. Um, so I hit on the, the clever trick of listening to it in an audio book. And a few of the early Benjamin Black books are read by the wonderful actor, Timothy Dalton. Um, he's always mocked for being a bad James Bond, but I always thought that was a mark of distinction in an actor. Uh, and so he read them beautifully. And because I'm an insomniac, I had to listen to them in the dark. I always think of that opening to Beckett's, you know, Beckett's text. Uh, a voice comes to one in the dark. Um, and as I listened to them, I was distanced from them because he was performing them. And I could have a certain objectivity. And I thought, you know, these are not bad at all. Uh, this is good, honest craftsmanship. So why am I hiding behind a pseudonym that, you know, I don't even pretend is, 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 is not me. Um, so I gave him up, killed him off. So my dark brother has been laid to rest. He's down there in the crypt on a piece of native Irish soil with a stake through his heart. Uh, and I'm going to write, I, I will keep writing these books. I like doing them. I'm quite proud of the, the crime books. Uh, I think they're well done. They say they're honestly done. They're done to the best of my ability. And they have, let's say they haven't got bound books pretensions. <laughs> so it, I'm free to like them. Um, it, it's interesting that you call them crime books, um, they're books that involve uh, crime, uh, but they seem, all of them, and particularly Snow, seem to me to be in one way an anti-crime book, because the book is an extended examination of our inability to know, for all sorts of reasons, in our interactions with people, partly because they withhold information from us, partly because we are full of our own content, which is directing us, misdirecting us, overcomplicating. 
and partly because it is the nature of being a human being, the truth is unfathomable. You get some facts, but you don't get all the facts. No, well, when I started to write these books, I, I made a pact with myself that I would be as plausible and as, as true to life as I could be, which in fiction is very difficult, um, but that I wouldn't write Agatha Christie jigsaw puzzles. Um, as Raymond Chandler said, I don't happen to care. Mm. Okay, as a plum with a lead pipe in the library. Mm. Um, yeah, I wanted to write plausible, fairly realistic books. And in real life, as we know, you know, we, we don't spot the clues. The, the murderer is very, very rarely caught. Most people get away with crimes. Most crimes go unsolved. And of course, in Ireland in the 1950s, uh, <laughs> if you had any power at all, you could get away with practically anything. Um, unless you annoyed the church, in which case you were doomed. Mm. Uh, so yes, I wanted to write, uh, you know, books that would be in some way believable. You mentioned uh, about crime fiction. The interesting and the annoying thing about crime novel is that it has to have a crime. Uh, and my ambition throughout, when I went to Bench of Black Folk in 2004, my ambition was to write a crime novel without a crime in it. And I have now done so retrospectively because the sequel that I've written, which will come out next year, is a sequel to Energy for April. And in that book, the victim of the crime, April Latimer, uh, is supposedly murdered. Her corpse is not found. But in this next book, I brought her back. So mm. I've retrospectively made for April, crime novel without a crime. Mm. Very, proud. Very proud of that. Um, snow involves, or the, the centre of snow is a man called Strafford. And one of the things, one of the things that strikes me about, I mean, there are many things that are wonderful about this book, but the use of name and the use of all the names are wonderful. People's names are changing and morphing. And you're interested in driving narrative through name, as opposed to comic names or names that betray character, because this, this detective is continuously having to explain to people that, that there's an R in it. He's like the Lord Deputy, uh, Charles I's Lord Deputy um, had the same name and was subsequently executed by um, the Cromwellians. And that's part of a much more complicated um, idea of his, he's, he's, he's an odd fit in the world and he's continuously, he's, he's rattled and is rattling around. Um, did that come from reading Simonon? Because it struck me that it might. No, I, no from the start I realized that, that uh... Once you got the names right, you're halfway there. Well, partway there. Um, don't ask me how I know that the names are right. I just do. And I was quite pleased to discover when I read Henry James' notebooks um, that he was obsessed with getting the name right. He had a long, long, long list of names in which he would choose mm. just the right one. Now, what it is, the chimes, I don't know. But I've read quite a few novels where the novelist just hasn't got the names right. Mm. And something, something is lacking in the book. So that's very, very important. Um, and I liked, I mean, this is a small running gag. Yes, Stafford is constantly being called Stafford, which is a, a, a name from where I'm from. It's a very, very prevalent name down there. Um, and then, of course, I call him St. John. <laughs> I also was amused by inventing uh, a son of the big house, son of the ascendancy, who would be a detective in the Irish Guard of Force, an absolute impossibility in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. uh, St. John Stafford could not have existed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a wonderful thing about fiction, you can do anything. Uh, I've always been fascinated from the very first stories I tried to write. I'm fascinated by the pact between the author and the reader, or at least between the, the book and the reader. Readers will willingly suspend their disbelief. They'll accept the most extraordinary things. Um, 
they will accept that there are hobbits living in a, a hill or wherever they live. And they read that as if they're reading about real people. This is a wonderful thing. Uh, we are all children at bedtime. We all want to be told a story. We're a house mm. We are. And everything has a story. I mean, Finnegan's Wake even has a story. It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Mm -hmm. Lots of stories inside. Uh, there is that ancient uh, aspect to the novelist that he is the, the storyteller of the tribe. Um, but names, yes, names, to get back to that, names are absolutely vital. But again, as I say, don't ask me how I know the name is right, but I just do. I can't, just... I can't get started on a book unless I have the names. Um, it's interesting. I completely agree with you. I think names are incredibly important and your names are always absolutely à point. Um, interestingly, I never for a single second found myself thinking Stratford, St. John, couldn't be in the guards. It never occurred to me. It n didn't even register as a tiny little blip on the horizon. Um, I thought, yeah, of course. Why not? He he has to go to um, a big house in the story, which is lived in by a Colonel Osborne, who's had a good Dunkirk and his wife and two children and various people. And you've, the story then moves it in, 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 there's a priest, there are um, the Irish industrial schools make an appearance later in the story. We're not going to give the story away. But it seemed to me that underneath the um, investigation is your investigation of Irishness and Ireland and our very, very, very considerable catastrophes. Well, yes, I mean, people of my generation, we, if we have any sensibility at all and any conscience, we can't blot out the terrible past that we have in this country, certainly since 1922 and the foundation of the state. And one of the things that happened when the state was set up was that the ascendancy, the Protestant ascendancy, tiny minority, 5%, who had held all the power, or most of it, they gave it up. And they said, all right, take it over. You can have it. The priests, the shopkeepers, the small farmers, you have it. We're done. And they essentially withdrew into their domains and shut the gates and took no more part in public life. Some people did, of course, Douglas Hyde, a great Irish language scholar and so forth. But in the main, they just relinquished power. This was, I think, disastrous for us. Second only to the disaster of partition. I am not in any way a nationalist, but I have to recognize that partition was disastrous for us because we lost that wonderful Protestant dissenter tradition in the North. I mean, I would love to have thought, imagine Ian Paisley in the doll. <laughs> you know? um, imagine Jeffrey Donaldson as, you know, Minister for, Minister for Finance. Um, so we did, we lost that, we lost that, that vigorous tradition, that very proud, stubborn tradition. Uh, and the church saw its, its, its chance and moved in with the connivance of, of De Valera and his people. Uh, the gunmen traded in their guns for power. And De Valera and his people were clever enough to spot that the way to power in Ireland was through religion. Uh, and a large part of that was to give power to the women, to the housewives. Because the church could say to them, your husband's a drunken sot, you know, if you make you have 17 or 18 children, um, you get no respect, but we will give you respect. We will give you power in the household. You will have the children. You will have power over them. So long as you make sure they are raised as strict Catholics. And there will be a certain Dane guilt. We will take a certain number of your daughters and sons to be in the religious. It was a very sweet deal for the church. And the country handed over absolute power to them. I mean, I remember when I was growing up in Wax, when I was a little boy, I was walking along the very narrow main street. 
in which there's very narrow foot power. And there's a woman with a pram, a pregnant woman with a pram and a toddler by the hand. Coming towards her was a priest. She got off the pavement to let the prince of the church pass. Mm. Um, now, look, the church gave us a great deal. They gave us free education system, they gave us a free health system. Uh, many of them, a great many of them, were decent men and women doing their absolute best. I was taught by Christian brothers, by priests. Um, I found them to be, the ones I was dealing with, I found them to be extremely decent. But there were, <laughs> you see, I was at the top of the class. I was in the front row. The children of the poor were in the back row. And they, there was no mercy for them. And they would disappear. One Monday morning, Joe Bloggs wouldn't be in his seat. Nobody would mention He would have gone to an industrial school. Uh, and, you know, where would we start on the churches and the state's treatment of women, young women in particular? Uh, so very serious crimes uh, lie heavy upon us. And I'm sure the young would prefer that it would go away, and that we'd forget about our gulag, but that would be a very bad thing for us to do. We really haven't... There have been various reports and so forth, you know, on child abuse. But I didn't make myself popular among the powers that be in this country when one of those shocking reports came out. The New York Times asked me to write an op-ed piece on it. And I started, the first sentence was, everybody knew. And everybody did know in that curious way that a people can know something and not know it at the same time. Uh, we're certainly not alone in that. My goodness, there have been other peoples who have... Uh, permitted far worse things. Uh, but I, as a citizen, not necessarily as a writer, I, as a citizen, I'm not prepared to, to forget, and certainly not to forgive. Mm. Why do you think uh, social care having been franchised out to the church, it was, um, they was, it was done so badly and so cruelly? What, what, what possessed them? to run the system in the way that they ran the system, which you, you, um, you describe in Snow very well, graphically. When well, I went to Eastern Europe in the early 1980s before the line and the, the uh, dismantling of the Berlin Wall, I remember in Budapest and in Prague, looking around me and saying, my God, it's Dublin, it's Ireland. They had, their lives controlled from the cradle to the grave by the Communist Party. We had the church. As the historian Hugh Trevor Roper says, Catholicism and communism are simply two sides of the same coin. I think it's absolutely true. It's very handy if you have a power elite who are extremely conservative and who will work to keep the population infantilized. A childish people is a people that is easily controlled. Mm. Hence, extreme censorship in this country, which one of the victims is your mother. Um, I remember arguing with, I was, of all places in 1962, between the Vatican Council, I was in Rome. And uh, I remember talking to a liberal priest I'm putting this point to him that, you know, an Irish priest. So, you know, if we keep censorship, if we keep this extreme control of people, we will become more and more infantile, we'll become more and more biddable. And I said, what if a real dictator comes along? We'll be putty in his hands. And he said, well, we can't educate people yet. It's too early. And I said, We've been around since the Firbolg and the, you know, it's about time we were allowed to grow up. He said, no, 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 this, this will cause, cause terrible. Um, there'd be social breakdown, essentially. Now, I remember <laughs> in the early nineties when the story was broken, but Bishop Eamon Casey had an American mistress and a 17 year old son buyer. And almost incidentally that he had borrowed quote unquote 70,000 pounds of parish funds to pay her off. And that wonderful story came out, which seems quaint now, 
when you think of all the things we've learned since then. But when that story came out, the Irish looked, raised their heads, looked around and said, God Almighty, the priests are gone. Rubbed their hands and said, let's start making money. Let's start having rock bands. Let's start writing adventurously. Um, we didn't have social breakdown. We had quite the opposite. We discovered a certain amount of freedom and we loved it. And there were, you know, each of us has a little moment when he knew that the, the continental divide was, was the, the, the shift was happening. Marion Finucane's talk show on radio on Saturday mornings. And she had on a, a bishop. And she was complaining about, she said, you know, if you really want to, you know, get the people back on your side, you know, you could start by getting rid of some of this ridiculous clothing, these high hats, and these things and so forth. And uh, the bishop said, oh no, Mary, you, you may not speak about our, our what we wear. And Mary said, I'm sorry. I thought, somebody on national radio has said to a bishop, I'm sorry, I'll say what I like. I thought, Ireland is changing. Mm. Um, and of course, <laughs> the Bishop Casey story was, was a great moment in Irish life. And poor Bishop Casey, oh God, he wasn't a bad man. There were people in the church, very well known figures in the church, who were infinitely worse than him. Anyway, I feel I'm becoming a social worker here. Listen, your book is germane to this because it goes from 57 to 67. Um, and uh, the way in which the country is beginning to change is, is, is platted into it. Uh, St. John Strafford arrives in Ballet Glass, Colonel Osborne and Mrs. Osborne's house and their two children, Dominic and Lettuce, who likes to be called Letty. And in his, in his um, encounters, he continuously feels that he doesn't know himself. Right at the very end of the book, when he re-meets Letty Lettuce, who's now got a different name, she's now called Laura, 10 years later. Um, lettuce wouldn't you change? He's, he's, he thinks about himself as, as back in the past as somebody he barely knew. Nobody really knows themselves, do they, in this book? They... Of course not. Um, but there is no self to know. Uh -huh. We have this illusion. It's a kind of it's a religion. It's a hangover from the great days of Christianity. We believe that inside each of us there is a little pilot light, sanctified pilot light, perpetually burning. There is no pilot light. There is no self. We make ourselves anew at every second. And a good thing, too, if we all had a self, if we were all a, a unit, the world would be filled with um, robots. Mm. Um, I love the notion that I have to remake myself at every moment, because I haven't have a clue who I am, what I am, how my mind works, and what's going on inside me. I don't know what my books are about. I keep thinking about Kafka's wonderful thing. He said, I... I don't write as I think, I don't think as I should, and all goes on in deepest darkness. Uh, mm. That's true for all of us. Uh, we don't know who we are. We, we strike poses, we assume attitudes, but it's not us. Uh, and it's great fun, you know, we're all actors. Mm. Nietzsche says wonderfully that the, <laughs> the man who seeks to move the, cr the crowd must be an actor who can portray himself. It's true, we're all actors portraying ourselves. Mm. And you said, you talked about Stafford looking to his past. When I look to my past, it seems to me, I, I mean, I might be looking into the Middle Ages. When I think back to Wexford in the 1950s, in the early 1960s, um, entirely different world. Mm. You know, we had the town idiot, we had uh, a couple who were obviously somewhere mentally deficient and they used to dress in very old fashioned clothes and they were followed through the streets being mocked by small boys and, and grinned at by grown ups. Um, it was an entirely different world. I shouldn't say entirely different world. Large parts of it were. were different. Um, and I, I certainly don't recognize 
the world that I moved in, and I don't recognize the person that I was then, um, if I was, if I was anybody. I mean, I, you know, the, in Wexford, I, I never learned the names of the streets. Mm. I wasn't interested. I, you know, I knew I wasn't going to be there long enough for it to be worthwhile. Um, I now realize that this is a great mistake, that there was so much going on in Wexford that I didn't take any notice of. I had a, I had a very grand friend who had, I guess I was 15, so he would have been 17. He used to wear three-piece tweed suits and watch chain cufflinks and so on. He was very grand. And he and I were pals. And uh, he used to instruct me about social life and the upper reaches of society in Wexford. And I remember him, I can see it still in the lounge at the White's Hotel. He and I were drinking coffee. Very, you know, outre thing to do in those days in Wexford. Um, and he was telling me about wife swapping in Wexford. And I said, what do you think wife swapping? He said, well, people go to parties and everybody drops their keys into a bowl in the middle of the table. And then you, you go home with, you know, somebody else's wife or somebody else's husband. Yeah. It's always called wife swapping. It's never called husband swapping. And I said, you know, this is ridiculous. You, 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 you're fooling me. Of course, now I realize I'm sure he was right. But I knew nothing about it because, you know, this place. Not that I particularly wanted to know anything about it. <laughs> it seems to be a rather grubby uh, transaction. But, you know, there are obviously lots and lots of things going on that I didn't know about. And certainly, in terms of what we were talking about a while ago, the children of the poor, uh, young girls who seemingly got themselves pregnant, you know. Um, I think they should all have claimed that it was a virgin uh, conception. Mm. I, my birthday falls on the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, which is always a great source of amusement to me. Did your friend in the three-piece suit with whom you had coffee, did he know you wanted to write? Oh, yes, yeah, I think so. I think, um, well, at that stage, I was trying to be a painter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I kept writing, but I decided that, that I'd like to try my hand at painting. I was no good, no talent whatsoever, none. Couldn't draw, no sense of colour, no sense of draftsmanship. But it did teach me to look at the world in a painterly eye. And that was a good lesson from that. So at that stage, I was an aspiring painter, but I, I never stopped writing. I, I scribbled away and scribbled away. Mm. At the start, I, I didn't have a typewriter and couldn't afford one. But my aunt Sadie had a big black remnant and looked like a tractor, you know, combine harvester. And I would go down to her house and sit for an afternoon, banging out these stories. Um, of course, I felt, you know, mannered type by her. I'm already grown up. I'm already successful. I'm already a well-known novelist. I was very arrogant. Uh, I was very pretentious. But I think that when you're starting out to be an artist, you have to be arrogant. You have to be pretentious. Being timid and uh, humble <laughs> won't get you anywhere. No. As you know, Carla. No. No, you have to strike out. It's... I mean, I, it's, I mean, I'd be curious to know where that impulse came from but to make. But one of the things that, of many things, many virtues that I was struck by reading Snow were the, was the recreation of the physical world, the painterly evocation of light, dark, trees, winter, snow. You're absolutely saturated as you read the book with the sense of, you know, the climatic and the calendrical and the specificity of this little house. Well, it's a big little house, this squire's box. Um, that, I think that took a lot of doing to make yeah. that work. Yeah, it's, it's always been my drive to try to portray the world or to set up a parallel world that looks, feels, tastes and smells like the real world in which we move and have our destiny. Um, I, first of all, I, I, I'm very old fashioned and I feel you, you have to learn your craft before you can claim to be anything else. So I spent, I suppose, five, six, seven years learning to, learning the rudiments of language and having to unlearn the mad notion that 
that we speak in prose. You know, that character in Moliere is wrong. We do not speak in prose. We speak in kind of gibberish, somehow managed to communicate something of what we're thinking. Um, so I had to learn to, to, to write and I, I love the natural world, but also I find it endlessly strange. Mm. The only time I've ever spoken my own voice in one of the novels was in the Book of Evidence, where the narrator says, I, I never got used to being on this planet. I think our presence here is a cosmic blunder. Uh, he says, you know, I think the people who are meant for here are somewhere else. But he says, you know, we don't deserve this, this tender, delicate, uh, this beautiful world that we've been given. And he speculates, he says, I wonder how they're getting on over there on the other side of the universe, the people who are meant for here. And he says, no, they would have become extinct long ago, these gentle earthlings, but how could they have coped with the world that was designed to control, contain us? I think that's true. I always feel a stranger on this earth. Not, you know, I'm not talking about uh, uh, terracination or, or, or I, I'm, I'm, I'm perfectly happy in the world. I, you know, I love it. Uh, but I don't feel that I'm part of it. No, that's not right. I don't feel at home here. I don't feel at home at all. Um, you know, <laughs> people used to say, uh, when I was young, and I suppose I was, I was a colorful writer in those days, um, people would say, oh, you know, you, if this is gothic stuff. This is not realism. This is not. This is not how the world is. And I always used to tell them. Anybody who said that to me, I would tell them the story of one Boxing Day, St Stephen's Day, day after Christmas. I was driving along Pier Street in Dublin, long, broad, uh, straight street, and there was nobody. No, it was completely empty. Everybody was at home, nursing their hangover. There was just me and on the corner of Westland Row, three albino men deep in conversation. <laughs> and I thought, if I put that in a book, people say, oh, it's in a damn book again, you know, indulging this mad imagination of his. The world is infinitely stranger than the most outlandish fiction. Um, this is another way of saying truth is stranger than, than fiction, but, you know, I, I I mean, I'm sitting here now looking out on Ireland's Eye and Lambay Island, Hoth Harbour, and, you know, it's exquisite, uh, very beautiful. But there's a seagull chick on the roof opposite that's obviously been abandoned by his mother. And he just walks up and down on the parapet of the house opposite all day long, crying for his mother. Um, and how does one reconcile the anguish of that poor little creature with the absolutely exquisitely beautiful October evenings I'm looking at it? Um, Eliot said about, I can't remember one of them, the Elizabethan dramatist, he always saw the Webster, I think, he always saw the skull beneath his skin. And I always see the, the abandoned seagull chick. Um, the world, seems accommodating, and in many of its aspects it is. But, you know, that sea out there would drown me in a moment. Mm -hmm. uh, a lightning flash could come from the sky and <laughs> I'm a crisp. Um, I'm always acutely aware of this. And I think that this is one of the things that drove me to write, is to try to not comprehend reality, but to give it, to fix it. For me, the world isn't real until I've pushed it through the mesh of language, uh, found images that will in some way chime with what I see and what I experience. Um, this is what makes it worthwhile. I mean, otherwise I would have given up long ago. It's too bloody hard, you know. St. John Strafford is, um, well, he, the, 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 there's quite a lot that baffles him and the, 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 
the, the way his inner bafflement is, is communicated, his misunderstandings, his attempts to think things through, his being misunderstood is all beautifully done. But at the same time, you are really acutely aware of the exercise of power, of dominion, of people and forces outside. He has to go to see the Archbishop. And that's a completely, it may be a baffling experience to him and not an entirely pleasant experience to him, but that's, that's a, he, is, he, is, he is running into bedrock truth. There are people who will organize your life as they wish it to be organized. So it's an extremely political book, as well as being a book about subjectivity. Well, unintentionally political, I have to say. I wasn't aware of doing that, but I can see, looking back at it, that yes, it is political in its implications, if not in its intent. Um, St. John Stratford is uh, a stranger in his own mm. country. Uh, after 1922, when they lost power, when they gave up power, uh, Ireland ceased to be accommodating to them. They had their own little world. I've always been fascinated by the Anglo-Irish, by the ascendancy uh, and their gifts. I mean, if you look at Hubert Butler, uh, one of the great essays the English language has ever had, he used to write these essays and publish them in Kilkenny People. You know, it didn't bother you. Know? Didn't bother being so vulgar as to trying to get yourself well known. I love that in, in the Anglo-Irish. Of course, as a concomitant, there's a certain feebleness. Uh, the native Irish Catholics who have been brutalized, certainly from the, the time of the flight of the Earls. Although um, there's an old communist uh, historian, I can't remember his name, I remember him saying once, we go on about the flight of the Earls. The people of Donegal danced for joy on the banks of Loch Swilly when they saw those murdering bastards sailing away. Mm. Um, so, you know, it, it, this is a land of ambiguities. Mm. Um, <laughs> we're wonderful. At, we're kind of like the English, you know, we're like our, our former masters and that we, we were completely Janus headed. We, at least two faces. In fact, we have innumerable faces. You know, I watch, well, in the days when such things were possible, I would see, when I was traveling out of Ireland, I would see tourists streaming in from the airplanes at Dublin Airport, arriving in the Emerald Isle, you know, the land of saints and scholars, the land of friendly pubs and so on. And I would think, my God, these poor people, they can't see behind the mask. And why should they? You know, when you're holidays, you're on your holidays. I mean, when I go to Italy, I think everybody's colourful and the food is wonderful and the women are the most beautiful in the world. I ignore the Berlusconis and the, the mm. you know, fascist past. But we are a deeply duplicitous, playfully duplicitous race. We love, we love the lie. <laughs> I remember being in a, a pub years ago. I lived in London for a while and then I came back and I sort of had to get used to, again to the Irish ways. You know, we were in Mulligan's pub and it was a noisy Saturday night, the big table next to us, it must have been about 12, 14 people and they were having a bitter political argument, I suppose, about Northern Ireland. Pretty well, all people talked about in those days, it was the early 70s. And there was a very forceful man, um, big guy, big muscular guy, very bright, putting very cogent arguments. And people were challenging him. One stage he banged his fist on the table and said, those are my principles, and if you don't like them, I can change them. Um, I thought, yeah, oh yes, 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 I'm back, I'm home. Mm -hmm. um, now, there's a, there's a kind of comic honesty in that that I like. Mm -hmm. I like our, there, there's also a, a kind of an anarchic streak in the Irish character. Um, and this fascinates me because I was talking to my brother a while ago and we were talking about the abuses of the church and the state uh, in Ireland, the Ireland that we grew up in. We were saying to each other, you know, how did we, how do we let them get away with it? This is a question I constantly ask myself. But then of course, you know, we were brainwashed from, from the, the start. 
when people ask me for my most influential book, I always say the Catechism of the Catholic Church, because it has everything. Mm -hmm. Who made the world? God made the world. Why did God make the world? Made it for man's use and benefit. And then as you go through it, it gets on to simony and concupiscence and lust and things like that. I mean, it's got everything. It answers everything. Once you've read the Catechism, it's all answered. You don't need to ask anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and we were, you know, little six and seven year old boys and girls were told that you didn't go to Mass on Sunday morning, you would be condemned to the fires, everlasting fires of hell. <laughs> you know? So the thing was done by fear. Uh, at least communism had a promise of an earthly paradise. We were told, no, you're going to be suffering to the very end, at the very end, you'll be really suffering. But then, once you pass that, cross that border into the other world, all will be sweetness and light. And when I was a child, even very early on, what terrified me more than hell was the notion of heaven. You'd be there being happy for all eternity. And all the people you knew would be there. The school bully would be there. The abusive priest, that cousin you really hated, that girl who wouldn't go out on a date with you when you were 15. They would all be there, all being happy. This was an absolutely terrifying concept to me. I would rather be in hell. Mm -hmm. At least it would be interesting. And there'd always be something that would be making you feel I eat flames. Uh, you know, the wonderful anonymous little poem. In heaven, there'll be no algebra, no learning dates and names, just playing all day on golden harps and reading Henry James. <laughs> Fantastic. Henry James part is all right. I mean, yeah. But the rest of it is terrifying. It is terrifying, your vision of he heaven. At, at the very end of Snow, there's a, a short, there's a postscript and St. John Stratford is in the Shelburne and he runs into uh, Colonel Osborne's daughter, Lettuce, Letty, who is now called Laura, as she is very careful to point out to him. And there's a lot of, uh, you describe, she's changed her hair, she's got sunglasses on her hair, she's wearing a short dress, it's the 60s. And um, she describes the man that she's marrying who has no recollection of all the things she's done to him that she has told Stratford about over the, much earlier in the course of his investigation. So there's a lot going on about memory and what is true and what isn't true. Um, but you get a real sense. Ah, yes, so McQuaid is in the past. The corner is, well, it hasn't been hasn't been cleared yet, but Ireland is sort of it's 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 improving and social chaos hasn't occurred. If you what do you think now in 2020? What do you think is going to happen to us in Ireland or the world? But we'll start uh, with Ireland. Well, first of all. People talk about you know, the world is going to change. We'll all learn lessons from this pandemic and so forth. People should read a little bit of history. The Spanish flu epidemic, so-called Spanish flu epidemic of 1918, 1920, was followed by the Roaring Twenties. Came the Great Depression, followed by the Depressed Thirties, followed by a cataclysmic World War. Um, when I look past the pandemic, I don't see a bright, shining upland. You know, I don't see a, 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 I don't see a heavenly paradise awaiting us. People don't change. When this is over, we'll go back to being what we were. We'll do what I said the Catholics did when the, the church lost its grip and power in the early 90s. You'd say, oh, look, it's gone. Let's start doing what we always did. Let's start being awful to each other again. Let's start making money. Uh, let's start doing each other down. Um, Ordinary human life, you know, we, we haven't changed since the caves. I was reading Tacitus recently. And, you know, you could be reading about Trump's America. Mm. Uh, you know, that's, well, 2,000 years ago. Uh, we don't change. On the other hand, I must say that I surprise myself by being quite optimistic about this country. I was astonished, and many people were astonished, after 2008, when we said, okay, we've had a 
10, 12 year long wild party. Now comes the reckoning, now comes the hangover. And we accepted it and we started to pay our debts as best we could. The Ireland that I grew up in wouldn't have been capable of that. So we are becoming a little more sophisticated. And I think, I think the government at the moment is quite good. I mean, they're making all kinds of blunders, the poor, poor people, I feel sorry for them. But you know, overall they're doing a pretty good job. Um, and I never thought, if you'd asked me in 1970, what I expected of 2020, it would not be the Ireland that there is here at the moment. I mean, you know, I look at my children, my grandchildren, the world that my children grew up in, the world that my grandchildren are growing up in, is infinitely superior to the world that I grew to the Ireland that I grew up in. And I'm so glad that they don't have to go through that hideous indoctrination that we, that we went through. Uh, I'm glad that they have some freedom. I was talking to my youngest daughter the other day, she's 22, and I was talking to her about book censorship, and she said, now, my daughter is highly sophisticated. You know, she's studying art history in Holland. She's very bright. And she said, you know, I find it hard to sort of believe that there was censorship of books here. I said, darling, you know, you wouldn't believe what it was like. And I was telling her that, you know, I, I frequently see old movies on reruns on television now, and I hardly recognize them. Because, of course, when I saw them originally, back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, they were pretty well cut in half by the censorship of film board, whatever it was. Um, so <laughs> you have wonderful things. I remember going to see, in the early 60s, going to see um, Night of the Iguana. And uh, <laughs> uh, Alvin Gardner turns to Richard Burton and says, you son of a... <laughs> um, and then, you know, censorship books was astonishing because, you know, the censorship board didn't go looking for books. Books had to be brought to the attention of the censorship board. Mm. They were not proactive, as I use that awful word. Um, and I remember taking a copy of Graham Greene's The Power and the Glory, and borrowing it from the county library in Wexford. And the central character is a whiskey priest, a priest who's gone bad. And he has a, a daughter. Uh, Every time the daughter's name is mentioned, it was very carefully scratched out. Not cut out, but scratched out. I still don't know what the daughter's name was. I must go back and look up the book sometime. Somebody had gone through that book. And every time the daughter's name, very careful. And it must have taken three or four minutes to scratch it out so carefully. Can you imagine a mind like that? And of course, to quote, uh, the great Jerry Adams, they haven't gone away, you know. No. Um, there are people sharpening their pens as we speak. Indeed. Um, we've been talking for an hour. It's been extraordinary and vivid and uh, marvellous. Thank oh. you. Thank you. And I would like people who've listened to this conversation um, to go out and buy a copy of Snow, because... Okay. Now we're talking. Now we're talking, because Snow will explain and amplify what you've been talking about. It will bring vividly to life that world that used to be, the, 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 what Ireland used to be, but it is no longer. You have been brilliant. Thank I'm you. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, I enjoyed it. Good. And um, let's hope the gods smile. Mr. Banville? Bye -bye. That's, a, that's a high five. Oh, is it? Yeah, 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 of the virtual variety. Thank you so much. Good, good luck, sir. Bye.